Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to America. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Abraham Lincoln, Part Three: Ma- Marriage with Mary Todd. We stopped last time in 1842. There was a gathering on February 22nd for the birthday of George Washington and in Springfield, Illinois, and Abraham Lincoln gave a speech at that gathering. And he said, quote, This is the 110th anniversary of the birthday of George Washington. We are met to celebrate this day. George Washington is the mightiest name of earth, long since mightiest in the cause of civil liberty, still mightiest in moral reformation, on that name and eulogy is expected. It cannot be to add brightness to the sun or, or glory to the name of George Washington is alike impossible. Let none attempt it. In solemn awe pronounce the name and in its naked deathless splendor leave it shining on. So he really had respect for George Washington and the two are closely linked today in, American, in, in, in Americans' sense of their great of the, our greatest presidents, uh, Abraham Lincoln that around that time gave a speech at the first large gathering in of the Springfield, Illinois branch of the American Temperance Society. Now, the Temperance movement uh, uh, dealt with the issue of alcoholism, which of course has always been a scourge, uh, destroying destroying so so many people's lives and and family lives, typically. Family lives, typically women and children, wives and children have been victimized, and of course the alcoholic himself. And uh, Lincoln argued that temperance leaders lack sympathy for alcoholics. He's, and Lincoln said, quote, If you would win a man to your cause, first convince him that you are his friend. Now Lincoln, see, most of these temperance leaders were Christian ministers, Protestant Christian ministers who would condemned the alcoholic as a sinner, and this, he felt, was ineffective. He disagreed with their methods. He, you know, he was, of course, in favor of helping alcoholics. Uh, Lincoln continued about the issue of, of alcoholism, quote, Indeed, I believe that if we take habitual drunkards as a class, their heads and hearts will bear an advantageous comparison with those of any other class. There seems ever to have been a proneness in the brilliant and the warm-blooded to fall into this vice. The demon of intemperance ever seems to have delighted in sucking the blood of genius and generosity. So Lincoln really, again, he he didn't think the temperance, the methods of the temperance movement were effective. He wanted them to stop castigating and vilifying alcoholics. He wanted them treated with respect as good people who were unfortunate. But again, he believed they deserved respect rather than condemnation. Biographer Ronald C. White White Jr. wrote, quote, If younger women did not know what to make of Lincoln, older women adored him. In New Salem, several older women mothered this awkward young man, cooking and cleaning for him and repairing his clothes. Lincoln reciprocated their affection finding a safe harbor in their matronly company. November 4th, 1842, Abraham Lincoln married Mary Todd. Now, they had been together, and they were, had, had been engaged. The engagement was broken, and Lincoln was depressed. And then, of course, they, they, they did have a reconciliation. And the morning of November 4th, uh, Lincoln and Mary announced their intention to get married that very evening. They didn't want to have a long uh, preparation the wedding took place in, in Springfield, Illinois, at the home of Mary's sister, Elizabeth, who was married to Nin, Ninian Edwards. The, the, the wedding was at 7 o'clock p.m. Abraham Lincoln was 33 years old, and Mary Todd was 24. They were married in front of the fireplace in the parlor of that of Mary's sister's home. Abraham Lincoln was 6 foot 2, and Mary 5 foot 2, so there was a 1 foot uh, height, difference in height. A week after his marriage or his wedding, Abraham Lincoln wrote a letter to a friend and he said, quote, Nothing new here except my marrying, which to me is a matter of profound wonder. Now again, the background of Mary Todd, she was one of 14 siblings. And when the Civil War came, six supported the Union, eight supported the Confederacy. 
They were from Kentucky, which was the most divided state in the Civil War. So her family was very divided by the Civil War. Two of Mary's brothers were killed in the Civil War on the Confederate side. Also, a brother-in-law was killed. And so this really fractured her, her family. Now, Mary grew up. Uh, she, her, her birth mother died when she was seven years old. Then she had a stepmother. And uh, she actually was raised mostly by a slave woman uh, named Ma- Mammy. And uh, now there's a story when Mary was 13 years old that she rode her horse to the home of Henry Clay in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And she was received at the home, and Clay had guests. And Mary spoke and said, quote, Mr. Clay, my father says you will, be, you will be the next president of the United States. I wish I could go to Washington and live in the White House. I've been gone a long time. Mammy will be wild. When I put salt in her coffee this morning, she called me a limb of Satan and said I was loping down the broad road to destruction. So anyway, I'm sorry, she was from Lexington, Kentucky, not, not Louisville. I'm mixing up my Kentucky cities. Now, Abraham and Mary, they both loved Kentucky. Lincoln was, uh, grew up, his earliest years were there. They both loved the writing of William Shakespeare. They loved poetry. They both loved Henry Clay, and they both were devoted to the Whig Party. Now, in their first year of married life, Abraham and Mary lived at the Globe Tavern in Springfield. They had a room. Room and board was $4 a week. So, in other words, they were having their meals with other boarders in this, in this boarding house. Ronald, biographer Ronald C. White wrote, quote, From now on, Abraham Lincoln's life would be like the three-legged stool that he had made as a boy in Indiana. The three legs gave the stool stability. If one leg were ever shortened or lengthened, the balance could become precarious. In the first leg of his adult life, Abraham Lincoln found success in politics. In the second, he established himself as a lawyer. In the third, he entered into marriage. The challenge that lay ahead would be how Abraham Lincoln could balance in all three legs as he reached for higher political office. Now, now Abraham, again, he had he was... He was uh, developing success in, as a lawyer and as a politician. Of course, he'd been in the uh, Illinois legislature. And a friend had this to say about the success of Abraham Lincoln, quote, Well, it is hard to say just why. It was because of the standing he got in the country, because he was a good fellow, because he told good stories and remembered good jokes, because he was genial, kind, sympathetic, and open-hearted. In 1843, Abraham Lincoln, John Hardin, and Edward Baker all ran for the Whig nomination for U.S. Congress in the 7th District in Illinois. Lincoln admired Baker and named his second son Edward after his good friend. Now, Lincoln, uh, during this uh, election, there was the accusation that Abraham Lincoln was the uh, rich man, the rich candidate because Mary Todd, had, his wife, had come from a rich family. And uh, now Lincoln was shocked by this criticism, and he said, quote, It would astonish, if not amuse, the older citizens to learn that I, a strange, friendless, uneducated, penniless boy, working at $10 per month, have been put down as the candidate of pride, wealth, and aristocratic family distinction. Another uh, criticism of him was that he was not a member of any church. He did not join a, ch- a, a church, Catholic or Protestant. Now, Mary was Episcopalian. Abraham Lincoln did go to church, but for, for his own reasons, he did not uh, formally join. Um, now, in, the, in this election, Lincoln did not receive the nomination of the Whig Party. So he campaigned, although he was involved in the campaign for Congress as uh, supporting Whig candidates. Uh, now, the good story about Edward Baker, who was also, as I mentioned, running for Congress. Baker loved, enjoyed giving speeches with a pet eagle chained to a ring uh, in, a, as a Whig candidate. And, and during his speeches, uh, he would be say, talking about how the U.S. had declined under the, declined under de, on the, under the influence of the Democratic Party. And during this portion of the speech, the eagle apparently was trained. The eagle would lower his head and droop his wings. Then Baker would talk about how the Whigs would restore American glory, and at that time, the eagle would spread his wings and scream. So the crowd crowd really loved that show that he put on. 
Now, there was, was one political meeting when Edward Baker was speaking, and uh, he, was, uh, he had had some conflict with a local newspaper, and uh, uh, so there was, a, in this audience, someone said, pull him down. A friend of the news, or this was the newspaper editor who was up, who didn't appreciate the criticism that uh, Baker had made of the new, of the paper. So this was this was an ominous situation. The crowd was threatening, uh, physically, Edward Baker, Abraham Lincoln's friend. Now at the time Lincoln was there, he st- he seized a stone water jug and said to this angry, threatening crowd, "Quote, I'll break it over the head of the first man who lays a hand on Baker." Hold on, gentlemen. Let us not disgrace the age and country in which we live. This is a land where freedom of speech is guaranteed. Mr. Baker has a right to speak and ought to be permitted to do so. I am here to protect him, and no man shall take him from this stand if I can't prevent him. So you see, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's kindness, he cared about his friend, his courage, and he really was against this this lawlessness which, which... would occur from time to time, especially in rural parts, small towns, when angry mobs would uh, get carried away and do bad things. Again, they uh, back to Lincoln and his uh, his married life at the Globe Tavern. They lived in an, in a room that was eight feet by fourteen feet on the second r- floor. They took their meals in a common room with the long t- term boarders and hotel guests in Springfield, Illinois. On August 1st, 1843, uh, Mary gave birth to their first child, Robert Todd, whom they called Bob. After And after the birth of the child, they moved out of this uh, Globe Tavern, and they rented a frame cottage house on 214 S. 4th Street for $100 a year, a three-room house. That year, Abraham Lincoln's income as a lawyer was $1,500 a year, which was good, which was good money for that time. Early in 1844, Abraham and Mary purchased their first home, a one-and-a-half-story frame house on, at the corner of 8th and Jackson Streets in Springfield. They paid uh, a thousand or twelve hundred dollars in cash, paid for the whole, paid for it in full. On, on May 3rd, uh, Abraham, Mary, and Bob moved into the new home. It was a Greek revival house, seven blocks from the town center and Abraham's law office. Now, at that time, the houses in Springfield were not numbered, and that didn't happen until 1873. So there was was an identification nameplate on the door of his home that simply read A, capital A period, Lincoln. And this really would be Lincoln's home for the the rest of his uh, marriage and his life with Mary and their children, their boys, until they moved to the White House. 1844, Abraham had a new law... Uh, Abraham Lincoln had a new law partner, William Herndon, who remained his partner until uh, Lincoln uh, became president. And Herndon was quite a character, quite an intellectual. He had a good library. He had the works uh, by by the authors Hegel, Kant, Francis Bacon, and Francis Bacon, among others. William Herndon bragged that he had dog sagacity and mud instinct and considered himself an expert psychologist. Now, in their law office, uh, Abraham and, and William Herndon, or Billy Herndon, they did not sweep the floor. They, were not, they did not keep a, keep, keep a very orderly law office. Uh, and they would be eating or- cherries and oranges and spit the seeds on the floor, which the clients who would come to see them often stepped on. And because there was, uh, they never swept the floor, there was dirt on the floor of the, of the law office, and these sp- seeds would sprout in the dirt. Now, again, a part of the, uh, uh, twice a year, Abraham would ride the circuit, the traveling court, for three months at a time, and uh, twice a year, because these small towns didn't have enough money to support a year-round court. And so he was away from home. It was slow travel by horse and carriage, three months a year. And so actually six months of the year he was away from home, three months, twice a year. Now, there's a story that, you know, when Robert, their son, their first child, their first son, was, was very young, that Abraham would pull Robert in a wagon around town. Now, Abraham Lincoln was often lost deep in thought, and he was pulling him. The story is Lincoln was pulling uh, Robert in this uh, wagon on an uneven plank sidewalk, and Robert fell out. And apparently Lincoln didn't, didn't notice. He was oblivious, and he continued to haul 
the empty wagon around the neighborhood. <laughs> now, Abraham and Link, uh, Mary, they, you know, they really had a lot in common. They really enjoyed learning and intellectuality and books, and they enjoyed reading books out loud. This is you know, long before mass entertainment, radio, TV, or any of that. And uh, they, Mary enjoyed the poems. They both enjoyed the poems of Sir Walter Scott. Now, one day, their son, Bob, was a little boy. He and his friend were having a play battle. And Bob said to his friend, quote, This rock shall fly from its firm base as soon as I. And now Mary overheard this she inside, from the inside of the house, and he called, she called it out a quote from Sir Walter Scott's play, Lady of the Lake, and said, quote, Grand mercy, brave knights, pray be more merciful than you are brawny. Now again, uh, Lincoln's law office was above the federal courtroom. Uh, at one point, and they had there was an open trap door. Sometimes they would li- open the trap door, and from their office, they could listen to the legal proceedings below, uh, below them. Stephen T. Logan was was another one of Lincoln's law partners, and said about Abraham Lincoln as a lawyer, "Quote: I have seen him get a case and seem bewildered at first, but he would go at it, and after a while, he would master it." He was very tenacious in his, in his grasp of a thing that he once got a hold of. So Lincoln worked hard. He was an outstanding lawyer. Now, his uh, law partner, William Herndon, whom he called Billy, he did drink, drink from time to time and apparently was intoxicated, would become intoxicated. And at one point, uh, he, uh, and was, he and some others, they broke the tavern windows and he got arrested. Now, Lincoln was loyal to Herndon. Now, some people said, why are you uh, staying with this, uh, out, this drinker, Herndon? Now, Lincoln came to bail. He bailed him out of jail. And to the, his critics, he said, quote, I know my own business. I know Bill Herndon better than anybody. I intend to stick by him. So he didn't give up on William Billy Herndon, his good friend and law partner. David Herbert Donald, another Lincoln biographer, wrote about uh, Abraham Lincoln's traveling the legal circuit, the traveling court in Illinois, quote, Staying in these small towns gave Abraham Lincoln a political advantage, and in his future political contests, his strongest supporters were attorneys and clients he met on the circuit. Yeah, that was perfect political, because these people became voters, and people who met Abraham Lincoln liked him. And so you meet a lot of people in his travels with the traveling court, and they became his political supporters. Now, in December of 1844, uh, uh, apparently Lincoln started his own law firm with William Herndon. And he, again, he was continued. What, when he traveled the circuit, uh, Herndon stayed and managed the, spring, the, the law firm in Springfield. 1844 was a U.S. presidential election year. The Democratic candidate was James K. Polk against the Whig Henry Clay. And Lincoln campaigned for Clay, who was his big hero, gave speeches. He ended up, uh, Abraham Lincoln ended up traveling to Indiana, giving speeches uh, in support of Henry Clay for U.S. president in 1844. And it was a very nostalgic trip because part of his childhood was spent in Indiana. And Lincoln said, quote, I went into the neighborhood in that state in which I was raised and where my mother and only sister were buried. This is 1844. Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln wrote a poem about his visit to Indiana. Quote, My childhood home I see again and sadden with the view and still as memory crowds my brain there's pleasure in it too. Near 20 years have passed away since here I bid farewell to woods and fields and scenes of play and playmates love so well. I range the field with pensive tread and pace the hollow rooms and feel companion of the dead. I'm living in the tombs. So I'm sure he was thinking about his his mother and his sister who passed away there. Now Mary uh, had this to say about her husband Abraham, quote, People are not aware that his heart is as large as his arms are long, he had these long arms that contributed to his awkward appearance. Now, Abraham Lincoln had this to say. That eventually, they had these four boys. Of course, uh, three of them who died young. But anyway, he wrote, had this to say about his children. Quote, 
It is my pleasure that my children are free, happy, and unrestrained by parental tyranny. Love is the chain whereby to bind a child to his parents. So he did not uh, support the strict, uh, sometimes very strict and harsh uh, uh, ch- childhood rearing methods, which were popular at that time. 1845, the slavery conflict was growing, and uh, the Baptist and Methodist Christian churches separated into northern and southern branches as a result, as the country was more and more divided. March 10, 1846, their second child, Abraham and Mary's second child, Abraham, I'm sorry, Edward Baker was born, named after Abraham's friend and political colleague, Edward Baker. Now, Mary was a avid reader as well, and Lincoln was remar- was very fond of his children. 1846, Lincoln was a Whig candidate in, for Congress, and, 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 May, and then around the same time, war started with Mexico. Now, in the, uh, in the election, the, uh, his, his, uh, the Democratic po- uh, opponent of Abraham was a guy named Peter Cartwright. There's a good story about Peter Cartwright that, uh, well, I'm sorry, there was a rumor that Abraham Lincoln had uh, a religious infidelity and was called an open scoffer at Christianity. That he cursed, They were saying, oh, he was anti-Christian. And Lincoln said, quote, that I am not. I'm sorry, that I am not a member of any Christian church is true, but I have never denied the truth of the scriptures, and I have never spoken with intentional disrespect of religion in general, or of any denominations or Christians in particular. The election was on August 3rd. Abraham Lincoln received 6,300 votes, Cartwright 4,800. So Abraham Lincoln won the election uh, for U.S. Congress. In late in 1846, Abraham posed for his first photograph, a daguerreotype, the early days of phot- photography. He had to pose for f- 15 minutes and not move at all during that time. Anthony Gross wrote, quote, Abraham Lincoln's family devotion was unbounded, and he loved his children to the verge of folly. He delighted to carry his boys on his back and to take one of them by the hand when he went to town. Their turmoil never disturbed him. Their mischief only amused him. He never viewed it with alarm. Now, there's a, a Abraham Lincoln told a story to William Herndon, and he said, quote, Billy, I heard a good story while I was up in the country. A judge was complimenting, a, a judge was complimenting the landlord on the excellency of his beef. I am surprised that you have such good beef. You must have, have to kill a whole critter when you want any. And the answer, quote, Yes, we never kill any. We never kill less than the whole critter. Another a quote by Abraham Lincoln: quote, "I am slow to learn and slow to forget that which I have learned. My mind is like a piece of steel, very hard to scratch anything on it, and almost impossible after you get it there to rub it out." Biographer Anthony Gross said: quote, "It was a common thing for Abraham Lincoln to discourage unnecessary lawsuits." and consequently he was continually sacrificing sacrificing opportunities to make money. One man who asked him to bring suit for two dollars and a half against a debtor who had not a cent with which to pay (coughs) would not be put off in his passion for revenge. His counsel, therefore, gravely demanded ten dollars as a retainer. Half of this he gave to the poor defendant, who therefore confessed judgment and paid the two dollars and fifty cents. Thus the suit was ended, to the entire satisfaction of the angry creditor. That was a good good solution. General John H. Littlefield wrote, quote, All clients knew that with old Abe as their lawyer, they would win their case if it was fair. If not, that it was a waste of time. Lincoln would not take a client that he believed in. And he said, quote, One story said, quote, You'll have to get some other fellow to win this case for you. I couldn't do it. All the time while standing there talking to the jury, I'd be thinking, Lincoln, Lincoln, you're a liar. So he was honest. He wouldn't take take, uh, cases if he thought the person was guilty. And I believe I should forget myself and say it out loud. There was a story of a a clerk of courts in Springfield had this to say, quote, I was never fined but once for contempt of court, 
Judge Davis fined me $5. Mr. Lincoln had just come in and leaning over my desk had told me a story so irresistibly funny that I broke out in a loud laugh. The judge called me to, called me to order saying, this must be stopped. Mr. Lincoln, you are constantly disturbing this court with your stories. Then to me, you may fine yourself $5. I apologized but told the judge the story was worth the money. In a few minutes, the judge called me to him. What was that story Lincoln told you? He asked. I told him, and he laughed aloud in spite of himself. Remit your fine, he ordered. (laughs) Good story. Good sense of humor. Abraham Lincoln. People enjoyed it. He had a lot of good, funny stories. Anthony Gross wrote, quote, Abraham Lincoln, who was one of the most generous and kind-hearted of men, often said that there was no act which was not prompted by some selfish motive. He was riding in a stage from Springfield, Illinois, to a neighboring town and was discussing this philosophy with a fellow passenger. As the stage rumbled past a ditch, which was filled with mud and mire, the passengers could see a small pig caught fast in the mud, in the mud squealing and struggling to free himself. Many persons in the stage laughed heartily, But Mr. Lincoln, then a lawyer, asked the driver to stop for a few moments. Leaping from the stage, he walked to the ditch over his shoe tops in mud and picked up the little animal, setting it on the solid road. Now look here, said the passenger with whom he had been talking. You cannot say that was a selfish act. Extremely selfish, said Mr. Lincoln. If I had left that little fellow in there... The memory of his squealing would have made me uncomfortable all day. That is why I freed him. So again, you can see Lincoln's, how much he cared. He cared about, here are these other passengers, they're laughing about this pig, and Lincoln cares about the pig, and even is willing to get his shoes all muddy to free the pig in this, from the mud. Now another story, Anthony Gross wrote, quote, While walking along a dusty road in Illinois in his circuit days, Abraham Lincoln was overtaken by a stranger driving to town and and said, quote, Will you have the goodness to take my overcoat to town for me? asked Lincoln. With pleasure, but how will will you get it again? Oh, very readily. I intend to remain in it, was Lincoln's prompt reply. So in other words, he was asking for a ride, but just sort of made a joke out of it. So this was a big deal. Abraham Lincoln elected to Congress. The big, you know, the national beginning of his career in national politics, the big trip to Washington City, Abraham, Abraham and Mary and the boys. They, on the way, this now this by the time it was 1847, by the time they traveled to Washington, on the way they visited Mary's family in Lexington, Kentucky, and during the visit, uh, Abraham spent long hours in the Todd Library, and during that visit, he memorized William Cullen Bryant's poem. Thanatopsis. So you can see he took advantage whenever there was a good library. In the summer of 1847, actually before this this trip, uh, Lincoln attended a great rivers, a great rivers and harbors convention in Chicago, Illinois. Of course, he'd been interested in rivers, living in especially in uh, New Salem. Now this convention was in Chicago, Illinois. Chicago at the time only had 16,000 people. Business, businessmen, farmers, politicians, and the press, encouraging navigation and business on rivers and lakes, and of course, uh, government support for, for that. On December 13th of 1847, uh, Lincoln said, quote, this was before on his way to, to the people in, in uh, Springfield, as you are all so anxious for me to distinguish myself, I have concluded to do so before long. No, I think that was yeah, that was uh, later. Anyway, so this was a big deal. Abraham Lincoln, October twenty fifth, Abraham and Mary departed Springfield, Illinois, for Washington, and the Springfield, Illinois State Journal wrote, "Quote: Success to our talented member of Congress. He will find many men in Congress who possess twice the good looks and not half the good sense of our own representative." It was a six week journey, a stagecoach, steamboat. Mississippi on the Mississippi River past St. Louis, spent time in Cairo, Illinois, tra- transferred to a steamer on the Ohio River, and they got on the Kentucky River to Frankfort, Kentucky, and then a Lexington and Ohio train 
railroad to Lexington, Kentucky, again, where they visited Mary's family for, for a three-week visit. Now, during that time, they went to a, attend a political meeting, and uh, Lincoln's hero, Henry Clay, uh, age seven, his son had died at the Battle of Buena Vista in the Mexican War. Clay had been against the Mexican War. Abraham, Mary, uh, and the two boys, Bob and Eddie, arrived in Washington, D.C., or Washington City, December 2nd. They stayed at the Browns Indian uh, Queen Hotel, a boarding house on East 1st Street between A and Capitol Streets, where the Library of Congress is today. At the time, Washington only had 35,000 people population, including 8,000 slaves and 2,000 free black people. Pennsylvania Avenue was the only street lit by oil lamps at night. There were rough cobblestones, and uh, they only lit Congress when it was in session. This was the 13th Congress, convening December 6th. There were 232 members of Congress. Abraham was appointed to two committees, post offices, post office and post roads and expenditures of the War Department. Well, that concludes today's presentation. Next time, we'll continue with part four of the fascinating and inspiring life of Abraham Lincoln. Hope you find a good history book to read or have one. There's so many amazing, wonderful history books to read. And uh, you might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History, with Peter J. Ray. PeterJRay.com. <coughs> so far, we've made 717 history videos <coughs> in seven areas. World history, American history, book reviews, poetic tours, Cleveland baseball, family history, and autobiography. There's a, we have a, a the, and, and the website is, is peterjray.com. There's a donate, donate feature. You might consider making a donation so we can continue making these videos. If you live in Metro Manila, Philippines, and are looking for a high school, you might consider Restless Educational Center. <coughs> Excuse me. Restless is located on Allenby Street in San Juan, Metro Manila, Philippines, not far from the corner of P. Guevara and Wilson Street. At Restless, we specialize in helping young people who have had difficulty in the larger traditional high schools. At Restless, we're more than a school. Where we are a warm, supportive community, and we strive to be creative and innovative. And the website is restless.education, R-E-S-A-L-E-S-T. Thanks so, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.